for at least a bike path, a, continu a contiguous, continuous bike path along the whole length of the road that any conceivable modification of the ICE-T regulations would accomplish that? Um, I did not specifically have that um, comment, but I will let you know that I had a uh, conversation recently with a sitting um, state senator who talked about the flexibility available. I think we've already seen with an additional $80,000 being added to this project, the state's flexibility pri uh, previously. Also, there is a former state representative in the room who may have working knowledge and may be willing to comment further. Uh, I did not ask him if he'd do that, but uh, I think that there is enough um, cause um, for discussion to at least ask the degree of flexibility. The flexibility issue has come up repeatedly. When I made the motion that carried four to three on this uh, project, we specifically listed seven uh, criteria and the state has approved all of those, including the critical areas issue, the no taking of public lands, the, of private property, excuse me, um, the stone walls, et cetera, et cetera. So I think after spending $37,000 of our own money right now, that we owe it to at least ask the questions specifically uh, regarding the uh, concessions that would have been needed. Would you accept uh, an amendment? Well, there's no motion to table yet, but if you framed a motion to table, uh, would you be willing to incorporate in the motion to table that in making a determination or further inquiry that the town expend no more than $300 from town funds for any reason? Sure. Yes, sir. Do, I, uh, do you have a motion to make this? Is there any other discussion? Councillor Fritz. Um, if I understand, uh, one, a former councillor is in the room that had a meeting with the Department of Transportation, and I, I don't know if you have any comment about what kind of flexibility we might be able to get in, in terms of not having a four-foot, yeah, Phyllis. <laughs> and that meeting was one year ago. I, I'm very reluctant. Just let's point of order. I'm very reluctant. We're not in a public hearing now. I'm very reluctant to have the uh, community as a whole present information to the council, not in the public hearing forum, uh, especially putting that particular person on the spot and having the council act not on information that's been provided to the town, but information that's been provided in casual conversations to a town citizen. I don't think that's fair to the citizen, well, and I don't, I don't think it's an appropriate way to operate as a town council. Well, then, if I, if I just might say that I, I am certainly not under the impression that the kind of flexibility to address the safety problems on that road in, ter in terms of, and where I'm talking about is on the hill and the curve between Hannaford Cove Road and the park, and, and really nothing in terms of widening on the straightaway of that road, I don't think that kind of flexibility is available with that federal money. So I guess I'm ready to go ahead and, and make the decision rather than table. Mr. McGovern. Mr. I, I don't want to get involved in the middle of the debate. But however, yeah. I, I do want to remind the council that they're in this project now because of the amendments and the cost increases the councilor Barry mentioned earlier. There are, in fact, two pools of funds. Uh, one pool of funds is for the enhancement project, which is for the bikeway project. Uh, the federal government, up to this clear, has been up to this point, has been pretty clear that we have to meet the four foot standard. Mm -hmm. However, there are other funds that are in this project that resulted from a very high estimate for a bridge project, which had nothing to do with enhancement funds, and those funds were, were available to this project. You know, I would hope that whether you vote table or not, you know, that that's immaterial, that regardless with the other instruction that you had as part of this motion, at the earlier motion, that I would work to the state, because I, I heard many councilors say they wanted to look at the state park entrance, they wanted to look at the drainage issue, they wanted to look at perhaps the Wheeler Road, perhaps, I wasn't too sure what I was hearing on, that at least for, for that portion of 
the bikeway funds that were not part of the two lights road bikeway enhancement portion, i.e., the extra money that was put into it, that at least even within the framework of your earlier motion, uh, that or Carol's motion, Councillor Fritz's motion, that I could still talk to the state about the issue of what about these funds that are now available. Uh, there's, there's been nothing addressed to that. Because I, you know, I've heard, you know, fix the problems, fix the problems. Well, there is money there that perhaps could be used to fix some of the problems and still, you know, not be tied to any of the bikeway standards because they're different. They're not the bikeway funds. They're these other funds that uh, came to the project. Was that was that under clear enough? Good. Would it be advantageous for the town manager to? in having these discussions with the state to not have this issue resolved in finality at this point in time, but to have uh, simply, obviously, you're going to take the state an indication of the council uh, what's most likely, but not having a final uh, definitive vote by the council in the hopes that uh, you would have more flexibility to be able to work with the state to see uh, how these monies could be spent, or is that an unrealistic expectation? Now, I don't think it really matters because, you know, the state reads the newspaper, they have clipping services, they, they know the 4 to 3 vote here. Uh, so, uh, you know, th that doesn't matter. Uh, however, the state does take the position working with PACs that these funds can be controlled by the town of Cape Elizabeth as opposed to simply having, you know, control up in Augusta. So, you know, what I'm saying is regardless how you vote on Mrs. Uh, Ms. Fritz's motion, regardless how you vote on what the tabling motion, if that should be made, I would hope to still go to the state and look to see if some of these monies could be used for some of the other problems that citizens have identified on this road that don't relate to the, the bikeway pedestrian path at all. What portion of the monies would that be? $81,000. Uh, about 80000 81. mm -hmm. That would be available? That might be available to look at the entrance to Two Light State Park, or that might be available to look at the drainage issue. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I know no one likes to ex ex just accept federal funds because they're there, but, you know, there have been problems that have been identified, and I do think it's worth exploration on those issues. All right, is there currently a motion pending at this time? Well, Councilor Jordan first. Do the funds have to be spent on Two Light Road? No. Could they be spent on the sidewalk in front of the school? <laughs> if the state permitted us to that we, that, we do have a pool of funds available for some town center sidewalk improvements. Some of those also take the nature of traffic calming proposals. Traffic calming proposals in other communities have run into severe, <laughs> severe opposition. You know, I don't want to get started down another shore road okay, or two light okay. road. <laughs> But, you know, we got, we got to do the school, and we're going to be talking about that some more, but I, I don't want to get out on a limb and get accused of misusing federal funds again, so. Is there a motion? Are we moving the amendment, or are we moving the motion? Well, I don't, neither has been made. No, there's nothing on the floor right now. I'd like to make a motion that we table uh, action on this item until we find out what the uh, flexibility is within the uh, guidelines for continuing this project. With the, pre with the financial provision? With the proviso that no more than $300 be spent in pursuit of the answer. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Yes. A motion to table? It's all right, speak on a table motion. Well, it's not really, but. Okay. I just want to ask, should we have a time limit on this? I don't want to go on six months to a year. My understanding of the motion was that, of the motion to table, and that's a, your question is one of clarification, not of discussion. Okay, that's why you can you. do it. And it's a one month time period where okay. it would come up again uh, at next month's council meeting. So that that was inherent in the motion. So if in fact this motion to table was acted upon favorably, uh, there would be a report back next month from the town manager uh, as to what he discovered and then uh, this motion of Councillor Fritz would then again be in order. That's the, the gist of the motion as I understand it. Correct. All in favor?
Opposed? Six to one in favor. The motion is tabled. Other items. Item 64 is receipt of report of the Town Farm Study Committee. Mr. Emery. The chairman of uh, this committee was Thomas Emery. Uh, he's coming to the podium now. Um, before he makes uh, his presentation of this report, to the Town Council, I would like to personally uh, uh, thank Mr. Emery. I've seen a lot of reports done in various committees, and I've seen a lot of chairmen operate, uh, but I just think uh, Mr. Emery uh, did an outstanding job along with, uh, uh, with the help of the committee. So, Mr. Emery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, thank uh, my fellow uh, Mr. Chairman and, and town councilors. I'd like to thank my uh, fellow committee members, and evidently not everyone uh, received uh, uh, tonight's uh, package or was uh, informed of the meeting. I, I trust there will be a public hearing uh, following receipt of the report, at which time the entire committee will be introduced and, and acknowledged. Uh, in the hall this evening, however, is uh, Phyllis uh, Cogshell, uh, past town councillor, uh, who was key and, and, uh, and attended 99.9% .9 of the committee meetings, understanding that we met twice monthly uh, for many months and uh, went well beyond our suggested de deadline of June 97 uh, into October. So I certainly thank uh, Phyllis. In addition, uh, Randy Blake served as secretary. Uh, he was a representative of the Land Trust. Uh, Joseph, Councillor Joseph uh, Groff is a uh, town councillor member. Uh, Mr. Donald Evans representing the Conservation Commission. Uh, Pamela McNally representing, uh, as a, representing as a citizen at large. Uh, Jack Roberts, uh, who's probably walked more of this town than perhaps even Councillor Jordan. Uh, as a citizen at large and was a tremendous resource in terms of uh, his experience and uh, no less uh, uh, town manager Michael McGovern uh, who gave us a lot of uh, insights and information uh, with respect to the history of the property. Um, if appropriate what I'd like to do is, is just give a, a brief introduction to the report based on the uh, uh, executive summary. And perhaps uh, for those at home uh, seeing this for the first time, just uh, let, let everyone understand what it was this uh, committee was asked to do. Uh, in November of 1996, the town council uh, formed this committee uh, and asked that we make recommendations to the council regarding the poor farm property uh, purchased by the town to resolve the obligations uh, to the Thomas Jordan Trust. Uh, also part of that um, instruction was a request to hold a public uh, forum. Uh, after doing some background work and research, the committee held a public forum in April of 1997, which was very informative. Uh, there was a lot of support for some of the early considerations that the committee uh, had come up with. Uh, that was really a fact-finding meeting for the committee. Uh, we were looking for as much public input as possible. And I think the committee learned that not everyone was in favor of keeping some portions of this uh, property absolutely pristine condition that people wanted to see some active recreation continuing. They wanted to see uh, people able to hunt or to continue some of the present uh, uses. The uh, committee considered the property uh, in two separate sections. We looked at the entire property. In addition, we uh, conducted a, a public site walk. But we divided the property for consideration to the west side of Spurwink Avenue and that to the uh, east side of Spurwink Avenue. Uh, the west side of Spurwink Avenue is that land that people see as they're driving toward the, the dump from, uh, uh, from the north and heading south, and that's the open fields and, and the marshes and so forth. Uh, the committee um, saw that as, as having a long-standing tradition as being uh, primarily open space, important habitat. 
and not entirely pristine and natural that it had been farmed for many years and, and so forth. And then, uh, of course, the east side of, of uh, Spurwink Avenue uh, is comprised of the uh, sewage treatment plant and the town transfer station. We were not requested to comment on either one of those two uses. Uh, however, in considering the port report, we took into consideration possible uh, other uses of those properties and, in addition, perhaps some future needs of those uh, properties. Um, I would like to uh, quote uh, directly, I guess, from uh, in the recommendations section. Uh, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, members of the uh, town's land trust attended virtually every meeting. I think the only meeting they missed, perhaps, was the uh, last meeting. And to attend these meetings, as you all know, in your own workshops, is much like watching grass grow and ice melt. And I certainly, <laughs> certainly commend people for attending those meetings and keeping a watchful eye whether they're in agreement or disagreement. And this is not to promote any political uh, cause that uh, any group or individuals may have, but simply to acknowledge that this town is certainly blessed with uh, a citizenry that uh, likes to be involved and stay informed. Um, we were, um, in terms of the west side of Spurwin Avenue, the committee unanimous, unanimously and strongly recommend that the rural character, I think a term you've heard this evening, <coughs> the natural resources of the west side of the sub area, <coughs> those portions of the property west of Spurwin Avenue, be preserved for future generations. Uh, such preservation can be accomplished in a variety of ways, including but not limited to the following examples. Uh, one through zoning measures similar to the Fort Williams Park District, not necessarily the same language, but a similar vehicle. Uh, two through a third party uh, conservation easement between the town, an entity such as the Maine Coast Heritage Trust or perhaps the, the town's land trust. And third through sale of the land to a third party such again as the Maine Coast Heritage Trust or the land trust. An important uh, statement here, although the committee unanimously agreed on the need to preserve the west side of Spurwink Avenue, uh, it did not reach consensus on a method of preservation to recommend to the town council. And I think that as much uh, is a reflection of the, the committee that the council, uh, the, the makeup of the committee that the council wanted good representation from all concerns and parts of the town. So I think that's very much to, be, to have been expected. Uh, there was considerable debate. It was uh, always, uh, uh, polite and, and uh, constructive. In terms of uh, uh, the committee unanimously and strongly recommends the following on the west side of Spurwink Avenue that we protect the scenic uh, quality. That was one of the highest issues raised in the comprehensive plan and the visual, visual access uh, statement. To continue passive informal recreational and educational uh, opportunities. To continue hay, haying, uh, tree maintenance, brush thinning, consistent with existing town ordinances to assure and reestablish visual access and quality, an acknowledgement that it's a rural open space, but it's not wilderness, uh, to allow snowmobiling unless such activity becomes a nuisance to other users. The committee heard from the public that uh, there was support for the continued operation of snowmobiling, and we felt that uh, this could be a, a self-policing issue at any time in the future when there appeared to be a problem or a conflict, issues were ra ra raised to the police that it would behoove the uh, snowmobilers to either police themselves or, or face a situation of no longer operating uh, on those areas. Um, we did not authorize, uh, we're suggesting that the, the council does not authorize informal parking on the hilltop field uh, by mechanical methods, so to speak, such as installing rustic fencing and stones, large stones in key areas. Uh, Parking should be provided either at the pump station at the bottom of the site, uh, limited to the current pavement only, or be accommodated on the east side of Spurwink Avenue. Um, we did not authorize organized sports involving, uh, we get into a little bit of language here so people will understand what the intent of the committee is in, in organized sports. Those sports involving teams with coaches, uniforms and established schedules and athletic facilities such as playing fields for soccer and baseball, and support facilities such as parking lots, bathrooms, and the like on the west side of Spurwink Avenue. Uh, we want to create a, suggest we create a committee to draft zoning language for a town farm district for review by the planning board and eventual town council approval, and to allow uses on the land leased to the Portland Water District in accordance with the terms of their uh, present lease. Uh, 
And addition, we felt it was important to highlight uses that, that seem to be in conflict and we uh, thought should be uh, specifically excluded. Perhaps this is not the definitive list, but certainly uh, uh, includes many of these. Uh, any new buildings, uh, communication towers, rest facilities, uh, for example, toilets or bathrooms, residential or commercial development, and creation of formal man-made structures or other uses which adversely impact scenic or rural character. On the east side of Spurwink Avenue, again, the land uh, primarily made up of the transfer station and, and so forth. As you look at the report, you'll see photographs that show a view up uh, Spurwink Avenue. And a lot of the character that one experiences on the west side of the open space uh, and looking up the uh, right of way of, of Spurwink uh, is because of the tree cover and, and canopy on the, on the uh, east side of Spurwink Avenue. So that we think that it's important to continue that, that tree buffer. And 100 feet seems to be the, uh, the, the important number. Um, we think that uh, recreation opportunities should be optimized, which are consistent and compatible with a transfer station, including the possibility of a sliding hill, trails, green belt. Uh, this area was identified in the comprehensive plan as part of the green belt, and picnic areas overlooking the marsh. Uh, it was a very pleasant surprise to get up on top of the cap landfill and look at the panoramic view. Again, there's, there's some photographs in the report. It's one of the highest spots in town and just a terrific uh, vantage point. Uh, we felt it important to allow for possible sewage treatment facilities. We're not promoting uh, such, but uh, in the event that it's necessary, and suggested an expansion area might be set aside, which is equal to the existing uh, uh, facility, uh, treatment facility area. Uh, and certainly consistent with the uh, lease with the Portland Water District, allow parking for possible future recreation access adjacent to the Portland Water District sewage treatment plant uh, parking lot, locate possible future parking outside the fence line and adjacent to the cap landfill area consistent and compatible with current uses. Uh, to allow possible informal, unimproved parking in open town-owned field abutting the Gilcrest Farm uh, driveway, uh, uh, permit, uh, if possible, a veg uh, allow or permit a possible vegetative buffer along Spurlink Avenue to screen that parking. And lastly, before any development of the east side of Spurlink Avenue, form a master plan committee, uh, representative of the town's interest, to develop a detailed plan of future possible uses for the east side of Spurlink Avenue. And again, that committee would look at both sides of the road comprehensively. And I guess in, in conclusion, inside the report, just uh, I, I think that uh, Barbara Ray moved the, the cover letter forward. It got buried behind the uh, appendix divider. Uh, there are many references people can go to for nice quotes for uh, reports like this. But uh, just coincidentally, I happen to be reading a few years late, but Charles Peralt's America. And growing up in the TV generation and watching bounce around the country and, and uh, out of uh, interest of his uh, recent death, I, I happen to be reading about his experience in, in going back to visit uh, a Yale professor at, in Vermont. And uh, in closing that chapter, uh, he certainly adds more words than, I, than I, I've left out much of the quote, but, uh, and seems kind of poignant in uh, the early discussions this evening. But this is in specific reference to not all of Cape Elizabeth, perhaps, but uh, this particular, this the west side of Spurwink Avenue. And that quote reads, when you're looking out and noticing all the ugliness that isn't there anywhere to be seen, and when you think about what so much of the rest of America has become, preventing the future in this one small place doesn't seem like such a bad idea. It's a very strange way of saying, I think, what we as a committee are recommending, but it, it, uh, it, I think it hit the nail right on the head. With that, again, I thank the committee, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Um, well, Councilman, uh, on uh, you mentioned snowmobiling. Uh, what about these ATV, uh, the the uh, all-terrain vehicles too? Would you include those? Our, our only discussion was with respect to yeah. snowmobiling. Okay, thank you. The normal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I should point out to members of the public that if in fact uh, the council accepts this report, uh, and I feel sure it will. The report will be available at the library on Wednesday. Tomorrow is obviously Veterans Day. I would encourage you, if you stop in the library, to look at this report 
There are absolutely gorgeous pictures. It's a history of this piece of land that has now been captured by this committee for all time. It's well worth reading. It's an important piece of land, and I would hope that many of our citizens would take the opportunity to go to the library and read this. With that said, um, I will move that we accept the report with great appreciation and refer it to a council workshop. I second the move. It's been first. It's been moved and seconded, uh, Councilor Reed. I'd like a clarification, Mr. Chairman. Aren't we uh, voting to receive the report? Yes, we are voting to receive the report. Receive. Receive, yes, receive the report, or I used the word accept, didn't you? I mean, to I me, did, yeah. I take exception to the word accept. I'm pleased to change it to receive. Fine. I would also ask that uh, would you accept a modification to that motion that it be referred to the council workshop at the uh, earliest possible time consistent with the council's schedule? That's fine with me. <laughs> and the uh, person who seconded, that's yes. also acceptable? Uh, yes. Any discussion on the motion? Councilor Byer? Quick question. Councilor Byer? That would be the time to ask more specific questions. At that time, we would have a council workshop where we would have the members of the committee here and the councilors would have a chance to read the report and actually have an informal discussion. Uh, the normal procedure would then be after that uh, uh, workshop, there's the distinct possibility of having a public hearing uh, before we, and you see when you read the report, there's certainly some issues to discuss. Okay. Councilor McGinty. I don't want to be redundant, but I just want to commend uh, hmm. uh, Tom and the entire committee. Uh, this report really jumps out. I mean, you've ratcheted up the quality of uh, committee <laughs> reports, <laughs> and that can be hard to match or can be difficult to match in the future. It is a great report. Uh, very well done. Thank you. Excellent. Any other discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion as amended. Opposed? Seven to nothing. Thank you. <laughs> Item 65. Action upon proposed amendment to policy manual of the Thomas Memorial Library relating to electronic information services and network access. Mr. McGovern. Yes, I would like to praise the trustees of the Thomas Memorial Library. Uh, over the last few years, they've been working aggressively at looking at policies, at looking at the strategic direction of the library. And one sign of this activist trustee group of, of the library is the fact that they did review all of their policies this past year and are recommending a new policy, which you have before you, and uh, Judith Simons, a past uh, school board member, uh, past recipient of the Ralph Gould Award, uh, is here. Uh, as the chair of the trustees to present this, if you so choose, along with Ann Carney, uh, who's also a member of the trustees of the Tosmar Library. Is there any counselor that would um, like to hear from the trustees at this point in time? <laughs> Is there a motion? Councilor Reed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move uh, acceptance of the proposed amendment to the policy manual of the Thomas Memorial Library uh, relating to electronic information services and network access. I'll second it. Second. Discussion? Council McGinty. I'm sorry, maybe I should have asked this um, of Ms. Simons or, or Ann earlier. Um, I have a real concern that the, the internet access by any patron at, of any age is not controlled. Is that, is that correct? Well, that, that's how I read this. Well, hold on. If we're going to do it this way, for the individuals at home, could you come up to the podium, Ann, and uh, identify yourself, and that way uh, everyone at home can follow this discussion? My name, my name is Ann Farney, and I'm a um, trustee of the Thomas Memorial Library, and I was on the um, subcommittee that drafted this policy. And it is true that um, there is no um, regulation to the, the access that, for example, children have. Uh, that's an issue that libraries all over the state and country have struggled with. 
and we did a lot of research into how those libraries dealt with it and the um, most frequently adopted solution and the one that we felt best um, took care of the concerns that we as a town might have about access was to um, adopt a policy which cautions parents about the unregulated nature of the internet and to have available at the library information that parents can read that will alert them to the problems that they might have or, or the kind of information their children might access and to um, approach the issue that way. That's been adopted by almost every library in the town, in the state, and it was the only workable solution that we could come up with. Can I follow up on that? Certainly. Um, in the materials guidelines for parents that, that uh, mm -hmm. as I was reading it says, and this is about how parents can reduce the risk. It says, in addition, there are now programs designed specifically to enable parents to prevent children from accessing inappropriate materials on the internet. I guess my question was, if it's available to the parents to use, why couldn't the library use the same programs to block, I'm not that much of a computer nerd, but to block out um, the access. If parents could do it, why can't the library? I have a big concern about you know a 13 or 14 year old getting on the computer and you know, gosh knows where they can go on the internet anywhere. Um, all they got to do is say, "Yeah, I'm 18," you know, and off they go. I, and that's my major concern. I mean, I, yeah, and I, then that was a concern of the subcommittee. But the problem with that is having the town ad adopt a policy that imposes censorship on the library's the information that the library um, provides to its patrons. And I think, and I'm not very clear on this, but I, I think that. Um, Teenagers who have a who have their own library card can take out any book they want in the library, and allowing you know teenagers who have a regular library card to use the internet. I mean, it's the same freedom that you're allowing there. There's different material, admittedly. The, the problem is how can the how can the, the public body censor that, and and the the. the, the resolution that we had was to encourage parents to enforce the guidelines that they think are appropriate for their children. I understand what your response is. I'm not sure that, I mean, I, not that I don't like your response, but I wish there was something we could do. I'm, I have a concern that if something happens with one of our teenagers, young teenagers, you know, gets involved in some chat room, you know, with who knows what, that, and something goes wrong, you know, when some 14-year-old girl ends up in New York City um, because of something that's happened in some chat room that she got involved in at our library. And I know I'm sure you considered all this, I'm, but I'm just expressing my, my view. So I, I wish there was something more we could do. I, I wish there was a better resolution, too. But as a, as a committee who looked into it, we couldn't find a better one. Is there any other discussion? Council. I just want to underline the point that you've made. I happen to agree with it, but the point is that the parents should be paying attention to what their children are doing and that the library is not able to take on that responsibility and still let them onto the internet. So I think we should underline it to everyone at home that uh, that is their responsibility. Thank you. Councilor Reed. Not to extend this conversation too long, but it's a fundamental and a philosophical issue. It's held in the schools by the school board and any provider of information for any adolescent and beyond. And the argument always is that we are not the parents. That's the parents' responsibility. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. Councilor Jordan. I agree with Councilor McGinney and what have you, and also Councilor Reed, but she says that the answer is it's up to the parents. But if the town is providing the service, and they get into trouble, who's responsible? Well, I assume that was a rhetorical question. Uh, <laughs> I, I my, certainly don't have an answer to it. <laughs> my, my problem, and uh, quickly, is that I'm afraid if the town, and I'm sure you considered this, but obviously I look at things legally many times because that's what I have to do all day, and I'm very much afraid of the fact that if the town got into making promises to parents or promises to anyone that we were doing X or doing Y. And then my understanding, it's almost impossible to do that, like in a chat room. You can't control what people say in a chat room and enticing somebody to come away. And the minute we gave a false sense of security 
to parents that they were going to be supervised uh, when they were using the computer at the library, I think we're opening the gates to a myriad of problems and really not servicing any parent appropriately. Um, and I wish there was a solution, a magic wand, the same little button we could push to get rid of some of the junk on television, but uh, uh, that's not the society we live in, and I think uh, uh, I would like to thank the committee for wrestling with these difficult problems and trying to come up with some written proposals which are certainly better than having nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comment before? Uh, is there a motion? I thought we did. We did a motion? Mm -hmm. And a second? I'm losing it, aren't I? And acceptance? All in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Six to one. Councilor McGinty against. Uh, Item 66, request from school department to transfer $16,145 from the school renovation project to the school's department's contingency account. Mr. McGovern. Yes, Mr. Charles Greer, the distinguished uh, chair of the school board is here. Uh, these are funds that are left over from the school project. Uh, the project was very well managed by the building committee, by the former superintendent, by the current superintendent, by the school board and as a result of investments and uh, fiscal uh, restraint throughout the project, uh, we do have these funds left. Uh, during the project, the building committee said no many, many times to the furnishings committee in terms of what they desired. Uh, the expense of what they requested that was really needed uh, exceeded the 16000 more than tenfold. And uh, this $16,000 would help to address some of those issues and Mr. Greer is here if you'd like to know any of the specifics on exactly where it would go. Are there any counselors who would like uh, Chairman Greer to go through the specifics for them concerning the $16,000? I know you would, Charlie. <laughs> and I would gladly sit here at the midnight and listen to you. <laughs> Since my colleagues don't really want to do that, I mean, I'll go along with them. Is there a motion? Councilor Reed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we authorize the transfer of $16,145 to this school department's contingency account from the school renovation project. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Just one question. It has no impact on the sidewalks on Scott Dye Road. I think no, that's, would... that's a separate Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, let's vote. All in favor? Opposed? Seven and nothing in favor. I think we should thank uh, Chairman uh, Greer for sitting through three hours of uh, the well, meeting for that. I, I do thank you on behalf of the town council, but I know how enthralled you were with the rest of the evening, so. <laughs> well, that's right. Um, item 67. Review and action upon Cliff Walk sign design recommended by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Mr. McGovern. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We work uh, with land use consultants uh, firm here in Portland that uh, has been working on the master planning of Fort Williams and also the master planning of the Cliff Walk Trail to come up with a proposed signage concept. If you may recall, this came to the council earlier. Uh, and you specifically asked for it to come back to the council. Uh, the sign proposed would be on a uh, natural rock. Uh, there'd be a couple of plaques. One would be the list the accessibility rules so that we're in compliance with the ADA. We avoid some of the issues the neighboring community recently had. And the second plaque would be a donor recognition plaque at which we would thank the principal donor um, is Gus Barber as well as Barber Foods who are contributing uh, each half of the principal uh, cost of this project. And I think the Fort Williams Committee in recommending this six to nothing uh, recognize that uh, this particular sign meets the needs of properly recognizing donors, uh, properly indicating to citizens uh, accessibility under the ADA, and thirdly, uh, keeping the rural character of Fort Williams. <laughs> the buzzword tonight. <laughs> Is there a motion? 
<laughs> have a question? Well, if you can't have a motion, we might as well have a question. Does the, uh, does the photograph or does the uh, paper represent the approximate size of the is, is there any, there's no uh, dimensions on either one? The, the, the actual plaques, if you look at them on the rock, are about eight and a half by 11. Nine by 12, they'll be in that range. And I'll move the motion. Second, with a comment, if I may. Certainly, Councilor. Are they already up on the rock? <laughs> <laughs> Not on the front, Bill, on the back. Uh, no, sir. No, no, sir. I would. I just want to know: Is are we being covered legally as far as the sign with on each end? I think at the last meeting that we discussed this, there was going to be some information from an attorney of what we, sh what their thoughts of we quiet to have the railing or not. Quite some time ago, I did get a letter from the attorney, which I provided to the council, uh, which indicated that they did recommend, wherever possible, that you have, have advisory signs in place. Uh, it wasn't a 100% a you know, must. You know, it, 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 was, you know, it was one of these letters on one hand and on the other hand. But uh, they, did, they did suggest that uh, we were better off having signs than not. But it wasn't a, a driving force opinion. So you feel this one is adequate? I believe it is in the Fort Williams Committee as well in reviewing it, felt it was. To have one sign. Is that, was that the question? I, th I believe the question yeah. was the, was this, the, what was said in this sign adequate? That is correct. And that's one sign on each end? On each end. Just all right. That's the way I read it. All right. Any other discussion? Council Sir, a question. In, in the, the photograph, it appears, I mean, I don't, I don't know, one is very light and one is dark. Is that an indication of anything? Yeah. Certainly. Answer the question. Why don't we first introduce yourself and what role you had in this uh, process? This is a sticky uh, situation. Yeah. Um, Tom Henry, I'm with Lane's Consultants, and I've been working on the Fort Williams project since about 1990. Uh, I'm also a member of the planning board, as you all know, and I have recused myself from discussion as a planning board member and have avoided mm -hmm. representing the project uh, during that time. Uh, the planning board, as you know, uh, voted. Uh, for the trail, but not, did not approve placement of any signs. I, this is where we've uh, come from there on the council action. To answer your question directly, the, uh, the photograph in front of you is, is an image photograph. It combines several different pieces of material and tries to put it in place on the site. And it's not a true representation of the color of the sign uh, or the specific materials. Uh, if the sign is approved, what we would do is have the uh, fabricator of the sign do a mock-up uh, full-scale full uh, for review and approval. And the final language in the handicapped accessibility would also be reviewed and supposedly uh, approved by the Corporation Council. Uh, I, I guess my question is, is there two different materials in no, the two signs, or would they both be... So they would both weather to the color of the rock and blend in uh, the same. They would blend in to the extent that there's no issues in terms of legibility for the accessibility sign. Um, if there's any need for color added to the plaque, we would do that. But uh, the general intent is one doesn't jump out any more than the other, that they fit well within the environment. And, and the intent is to be like bronze that would weather? That's correct. Any further questions? Hearing none, uh, call vote. All in favor? Opposed? Seven to nothing in favor. Action upon Fort Williams Advisory Commission recommendation to permit the annual British Car Show to be held on September 13, 1998, with a rain date of September 20th, 1998. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission has previously unanimously recommended approval. Is there a motion? 
So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Seven to nothing in favor. Action upon the Fort Williams Advisory Commission recommendation to permit the annual MS Society walk on April 19th, 1998, item 69. Move. Fort Williams Advisory Commission unanimously recommended approval of this item. Second. Is there a motion? A first. There is a motion and there's a second by Councillor Jordan. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Seven nothing. It passes. Um, acceptance of land. Item, two, item 70. Action upon recommendation from town manager to spend up to $10,000 to improve lighting and acoustics at the entrance to the Thomas Memorial Library. Mr. McGovern. Yes, you discussed this issue at an earlier workshop and asked us to go back and look at a number of options. We've done that. Uh, you know, this is very troubling for me. Uh, I uh, bring it to you very he with much hesitation, but also I think in the spirit of the earlier discussion that when you know that there's problems that exist, they ought to come to the attention of the council and give you an opportunity to address them. Uh, if you work in this area for eight hours, you really recognize what the problem is. You come in, everything echoes off the, the high ceiling there. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a problem. Uh, you, you hear it on the phone if you talk to someone who is, is at that workstation, it, it comes across. It's a lot of money, uh, $10,000. Uh, it would provide acoustical ceiling on both the wall and uh, the ceiling. It's felt that it's the most effective solution. Uh, it does include lowering of the sprinkler system, the smoke detector, so we're all in code, as well as improving lighting, which is an observation uh, the folks who work there have made that the lighting isn't too good. So I, uh, I hate spending $10,000 more dollars on, on this particular issue, this, this project, uh, but I, I do feel that uh, in keeping with uh, the, the need to have a, a good working environment, uh, for our workers and uh, the welcoming approach to the patrons so they can hear what's being said between them and the person at the counter, I uh, do feel that the council uh, ought to undertake this expense utilizing funds that were in the overlay for uh, this fiscal year. Mr. Chairman, uh, could I ask a question? Mr. Barrett. Of the, of the uh, manager, uh, I notice you have uh, a suspended ceiling would uh, be less money. Would it be possible to uh, try that to see if it uh, satisfactorily uh, deals with the problem before proceeding with the entire project, or what do you think? The, that option is $6,300 instead of $10,000. Uh, you know, the, the problem is, this, the aesthetically it would change, and that was a major issue you wanted me to look at. But it, it also, the, the acoustical, forgetting the word, uh, studies that one does, and I don't want to, you know, Get you, that would spend a lot of money on studies, but the the studies that they've done, the, the acoustical factor that you achieve, like a, like an R rating you achieve for insulation, is that much higher for the the ceiling and the wall covering than it is for the ceiling tile. You you you, you get that much oomph uh, for the work that you do, more oomph. So, you know, I, I just hate to spend sixty three hundred dollars and not have it work. I hate to spend ten thousand and not have it work. But the architects give me much greater assurances that the more expensive option will do a much more effective job. Okay. Plus, there's the aesthetic issue. Is there any recourse to the advice one gets from architects when it doesn't work? <laughs> Were they the original architects, Terry? Uh, the original architects, way, way back to the building, or well, was Portland design team well, for the remodeling but the, for the remodeling it was Terry and you just for our public at home I mean just to be candid this is sort of the uh, project that's been uh, ended up to be way way more expensive than anybody envisioned it's operated in a piecemeal fashion and that I think it is part of the frustration of many of the counselors uh, concerning this particular item Councillor Reed, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, Michael, I was wondering what the architects gave you for an assurance that this would solve the problem on a scale of 1 to 10. I didn't ask them for a scale of 1 to 10. You but he, uh, in talking with the principal of Terry and Architect, uh, he, he indicated that he really felt this would do the job. He's a citizen of the community. He doesn't want us to waste $10,000. Uh, 
I think it's agonized him as, as much as anyone. I know he wouldn't be recommending it unless uh, he felt it would be effective. And my second question is, is this done by our maintenance staff or is this contract and bid it out? I've had some discussion <coughs> with the facilities manager about this topic and uh, we're still studying the whether or not they can do it and how much they can do it. Ernie seems to think there's some of it that they can do uh, that, that could possibly reduce the cost. And, you know, we, we are still exploring that. And, uh, he's, look, he's looked at the numbers that the uh, contractor submitted and he, quite, he does think that they're high. Well, I, the only reason I mention it, and then I'll get off this, but mm. we have a lot of materials, you know, pieces here, pieces there of materials left from other projects, and it, I just hope that we look first at what we might have in-house, even if the house is the school department, and see if perhaps we couldn't uh, use some of that. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Is there a motion? Councillor Reed. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that, uh, reluctantly, um, that the town council authorizes the town manager to spend an additional $10,000 to repair and improve the uh, lighting and acoustics at the entrance of the Thomas Memorial Library, not to exceed $10,000, please. So your motion was to spend up to $10,000? I'll second that, and I was going to add that to it, up to $10,000. Right. Well, that, my understanding, that is the motion, up that to $10,000. And I just hope this will be the last. Don't we all? Um, any further discussion? Vote. All in favor? Opposed? Six to one. With Councillor Byer opposed. Uh, item 71, acceptance of land owned by David A. Schumann extending out to the center line of Two Lights Road. Mr. McGovern. Yes, when we were, uh, did the surveying for the Two Lights Bikeway, uh, we discovered through the survey as well as through communication with David Schumann that part of Two Lights Road as it currently exists uh, was in fact on his property. Uh, when it was studied, it was found that it was on his property at one point all the way out to the center line of the road. Uh, really a, a, a severe issue, a severe problem. I'm very pleased to report that uh, after six or seven meetings uh, the engineers had with Mr. Schumann as well as uh, <coughs> myself that uh, he has uh, signed a deed uh, transferring to the town uh, the portion of Two Lights Road uh, that was on his property. And I would uh, ask that you accept uh, the deed on behalf of the town uh, of Cape Elizabeth with appreciation to Mr. Schumann uh, for squaring away this problem that's been in place for decades. So moved. Second. Discussion? Uh, Council Barry. Mr. Chairman, I, I have been presented with uh, a, a document from Mr. Schumann uh, showing that there is a difference between the, uh, uh, the figure, the dimensions uh, proposed by the uh, engineers and his own me measurements and dimensions. I wonder if, the, if I could ask the manager as, if he's aware of this uh, sheet and if he discussed this with Mr. Schumann. I had many, I don't know what the date is of that sheet. Uh, when did I, I did know that there was a sheet earlier that they reviewed. He reviewed it again, and he found out they were within one sixteenth of an inch as of the time that I last spoke to him when he signed the deed. This was just handed to me by somebody tonight, so I just I wanted to make sure that the dimensions were accurate. So, yeah, he his last conversation with me said it was within one sixteenth of an inch. Any other discussion? Vote all in favor. Opposed. Seven and nothing in favor. Um, item 72, we're into the consent agenda now, but a councilor has asked that this item be removed from the consent agenda. Uh, it is action upon recommendation from town manager Ray Holiday Hours. Mr. McGovern, what is this? What is the recommendation? Uh, December 26th falls on a Friday this year. I'm recommending that the, uh, all of the essential services be closed on that day. Uh, the uh, public, the transfer station will be open because that's a busy day with holiday wrappings and whatever. Uh, that we close the refuse disposal area, the town hall, library, etc., on 3 p.m. on uh, Wednesday, December 24th. 
and 31st for the refuse disposal area, that the town hall also close at 3 p.m. on the 24th, but that it remain open until its usual time on the 31st, which would be 4 o'clock. Uh, we'd all have regular hours on January 2nd, 1998, which is the Friday following uh, New Year's Day, and the library would be open on Saturday, December 27th, 1997. Uh, there's also an additional issue here with the Public Works employees uh, who, are, who are started to be involved in collective bargaining but are not yet, don't yet have a collective bargaining agreement, and that's addressed in this memo as well. Councillor Reed. Mr. Chairman, I have two questions. One, that even though the public works is not um, protected under a contract, they are in fact union, is that correct? That is correct. They are um, represented by local 340 of the Teamsters. Could I ask that discussion of uh, the public works schedule be um, dovetailed with the <coughs> negotiations in executive session tonight? Is that an appropriate request? It's separate than this. I mean, is it fair to say, Mr. McGovern, that at this point in time, if the council authorizes uh, these hours, uh, we are not authorizing hours for public works employees, as that is an item that you will have to be separately addressed with their union. Is that correct? Yes, but, that's, but you're asking me to respond to something before there's a motion, so not knowing what the motion might be. Well, what I'd like to do is make a motion to um, limit uh, the discussion for right now on item number 72 to non-union workers and to have the discussion about the union employees time to work the holiday schedule in executive session in light of the fact that we are discussing collective bargaining issues later tonight. If that's a that, that, that's I'm a little confused because I thought that was the intent of the policy that um, the town manager was not unilaterally attempting to implement a schedule for union employees. The police is separately called for by their contract. The other public works that would have to be addressed with the union so that the town manager's recommendation only went to other town employees at this point in time. Is that correct, Mr. McGovern? What's correct is what I have in my memo, yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, the other part of my concern is um, I would like to um, have a discussion about closing Town Hall and Thomas Memorial Library, uh, non-essential services as we call them, at 1 o'clock instead of 3 o'clock as proposed in Mr. McGovern's memo. Is that just one question? Just for uh, the 24th of December. Right. Any further discussion? I just want to clarify, you're talking about the refuse disposal area closing at 1 o'clock rather than 3. Is that? No, Thomas Memorial Library and the Town Hall. Okay. And the reason that I'm suggesting that is I think it is extremely unlikely that there will be customers using those um, two buildings on uh, between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock on December 24th, based on past years and uh, personal observation. If I might, the refuse disposal area is also staffed by Public Works Union personnel, and you'd want to discuss that. In well, that's why I didn't want to discuss it. So who does that leave? That leaves the town hall and the library, is that? Correct. And the chief of police and the police captain. The, the non-essential uh, non people. The, <laughs> the facilities manager. With all the respect, I mean. Yeah. Oh. In, in all candor, I think we're getting to the point where we're micromanaging and that it's fine, the broad brush that uh, the non-union employees that we've talked about uh, uh, would not work on the Friday and that the discretion of the town manager would be able to, uh, if their services weren't essential, be able to not work uh, part of the afternoon of that day. But I feel very comfortable leaving that to the town manager's discretion to be able to uh, uh, handle the town workforce in a 
fitting way at the holiday with that broad general guidance. Well, isn't it up to the town council to authorize the closure of uh, a building earlier and other than a snowstorm? Well, we did, didn't we, by giving him the discretion on that afternoon to close early. <coughs> Councilor Jordan, you look like you want to say something. Yes, I did want to say a little something before I lose my voice. I don't know what's happening, but I've been at a meeting since 9 o'clock this morning with Farm Bureau going through the same type of things, only different language and different words. So, But I did want to say we're not doing anything here given the public works a day off that would jeopardize the negotiations. My understanding is we're not talking about public works at all. Okay, but as I read the memo, it speaks of the day off, day after. That's all I want to know. Whether My understanding, Councilor Jordan, is right now you're addressing the non-union personnel uh, following executive session, or you would give me some instruction as to how to how to deal with the union personnel, which includes public works. So public works isn't included in this memo. It's included in the memo, but you, if someone makes a motion, I assume it's going to for now only cover the non-union employees, okay, okay. and you would separately deal with the public works employees. And I have no no big problems whether it's one o'clock or three o'clock. I hope there's something they can do. If there isn't, uh, we'll find them. Well, the chair would accept the motion. Uh, I think I would like to move that the town manager be given discretion in regard to the early time of closing for employees on the 24th and the 31st of December, uh, those employees being non-union. And, and that uh, the, the day after Christmas we be closed? Yes, exactly. Right. So second to that motion? Second to that motion. All in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Seven to nothing. Nice. Wish we could find a better word for non-essential. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's called non-essential. I always thought they all were essential. All right, on the, on the uh, item 73, 74, 75 in the consent uh, calendar, uh, item 73 is a pole location on Fessenden Road. Uh, item 74 is recommended fees uh, from the GIS system. And item 75 is action upon recommendation in 1998 season at Spurwink Church on October 3rd in order to provide an opportunity for roof repairs. Is there a motion moving the consent agenda? So I move. So Second. Second. All in favor? Seven to nothing. So items 73, 74, and 75 are passed unanimously. Um, is there a motion to uh, enter executive session to discuss land acquisition slash disposition and a motion to uh, enter executive session to provide the town manager instruction for collective bargaining with Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent Association and with local 340 of the Teamsters. Second. Second. For the comment, please. I would like to know if it would be going up beyond 11 o'clock. Um, shouldn't go too late. I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And the other question is I'd like to ask the manager before we close about those poles that are put up on the poor farm. I think I spoke to him once before. Along the edge of the marsh, in the field, they got some four by four poles going along the woods there, in the field, and I'd like to know what they're for. I just had a question. Michael, uh, the Conservation Commission just uh, sent us a memo, a copy of minutes, which uh, reference those polls is that yeah I uh, my, my understanding is it's for the, the trail system that's going in along there uh, on the I didn't know there's a trail system going in there mm -hmm. a proposed trail system yeah voted by the council hmm? voted by the council 
Yes. You say voted by the council? It was voted by the council back in 1979 oh, or 80. Come on. No, it was back when it, then. it was back when the the name on it. Then. The Maine Coast Heritage Trust bought the land from the Shaw Sprague trustees. And then the money was the money. The the land was then sold at that point to Dr. Lynch uh, to uh, with with all the conservation trails that were then put into place, which then was sold to Chi uh, with all those restrictions, and then Chi sold it to Barber. And the conservation commission has been working very closely uh, with uh, uh, David Barber, uh, who's the current owner of the property. I'm talking about the poor farm. You can yeah, see runs, from Spark Avenue running up towards the dump, if you look out across that field, yeah. you can see them poles following the edge of the woods right around. I'd just look. like to know what they're for. I'll go look. Okay. But I, Thank they, you. They've got to have something to do with the trailer. I haven't, I haven't seen them. You can see them if you ride up the road pretty easy. Are they laying flat? No, they're standing up. All right. Let's, uh, at least let's move four forward. Or five it's, feet out of the woods. it's actually 20 of 11, and okay. I think we'll this is. Well, there's uh, obviously no citizens in the audience left, so there's no <laughs> citizens discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there a motion? Uh, but we're not adjourning, but it is not anticipated that we will be coming back in the public session. Did they say it over there? Uh, so we are now moving into executive session after a few minute break. Thank you. Good night. I should pass that back to them. Yeah, I don't think it's hard on that side. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. So why don't you keep it and then we'll do it in the room.